In this video I'm going to look at some data that were collected from two different samples that are presented as pellets formed from Fe203 powder and Fe304 powder. And the measurements consist of, after initial measurements to investigate what the XPS looks like of these samples, a sequence of iterations, meaning measurements that are identical and are just simply repeated one after the other over a period of time. And this is done for both the Fe203 and also the Fe304. On the face of it, we would like to think that there would be some significant difference between the spectra that are measured from the Fe203 and the Fe304. So I've just selected the iron 2p doublets that were measured as part of the iterations and I'll overlay these in the active tile. The active tile is the one with the blue bar across the top. There are other tiles here. They were not active so when I press the overlay button both appeared in this active tile and we can see once we've overlaid these data that there is a difference between the two spectra at least there appears to be a difference there is an offset between the two now this offset is what in most measurements by XPS we would associate with a change in chemical state however in this instance we can see that these offsets are not associated with a chemical state by observing that a similar shift occurs for carbon, oxygen and the iron 2p. So we have to conclude from this that the measurement between these two samples is different in some respect. So the first question should be are these shifts reproducible? So this is part of performing a series of iterations is that yes the spectra appear very very similar when measured from the Fe203 pellet versus what we see for the Fe304 which once again very similar. So they are certainly repeatable for each of these samples and we would expect to see when we select all of these two classes of spectra all very similar but offset and that's exactly what we see so we have to ask what is causing this shift if we don't believe it to be chemical state what is the reason for this shift and the answer is that these two samples were measured assuming that they were insulating materials and both were measured using charge compensation and in this instance the charge compensation is low energy electrons that are returning to the sample surface by a filament mechanism and these low energy electrons are having a profound influence on one that is to say the Fe203 and almost no influence on the Fe304. Now that suggests that we have different material properties here. That although the spectra look very very similar, one of them is capable of moving charge from ground, because both are connected to ground, through the material and provide a potential at the surface during the measurement by XPS. Whereas the other one no electrons are coming from ground and only the electrons that are arriving via the charge compensation are altering the potential of the sample. And we can see this more clearly if I display the carbon 1s. We'd expect the carbon 1s to be somewhere around 285 eV. And if we look at the one set, this is 284.3 Eight. This is very close to what we would expect for a material with carbon that is at the correct binding energy. On the other hand, if we look at 
the other measurement, this is the Fe203, what we have here is a binding energy for the carbon. The apparent binding energy is 282. So this has been offset and that would be consistent with additional charge, negative charge on the surface, accelerating electrons away from the sample as part of the emission process. And therefore the apparent binding energy for the Fe203 carbon S is at a lower binding energy, higher kinetic energy. So we can see that the electrical properties of these two materials, two samples, they are in fact different, even if the Fe2P spectra look very similar. The anomaly in these measurements is that the spectra do look very similar. In fact, the Fe2P is not the only photoemission line measured from iron. And if we step over and look at the Fe3P, this is a much higher kinetic energy photoemission line. Even here we are seeing very similar behavior, the offset, and similar shapes. And it's not until we look at the valence band do we see that there really is something different about these two samples. And it begs the question, why are we seeing similar spectra for the Fe2P and the Fe3P? Because the valence band is significantly different in shape. This means that we need to investigate these samples in more detail to see if we can understand why we see similar shapes when we would expect them to be different for these photoemission lines, the Fe2P and the Fe3P. The fact that we can actually see some change in spectral shapes in the valence band will be useful in trying to understand why we don't see a change in the Fe3P. What I will do is single out the Fe304 and merge data between the Fe3P and the valence band so I have a spectrum that will modify both the Fe3P and the valence band at the same time and try and understand if there are in fact changes occurring during the course of these iterations for the Fe304 that will highlight why there should be a difference or similarity between the spectra from the Fe203 and the Fe304. To facilitate working on the Fe304 data I'm going to select these and move a copy to a new VAMAS file. So I'm creating a, a new experiment frame and I'm using the copy button, copy paste button, that will allow me to copy the selected VAMAS blocks from the other file into this empty file. So now I have my spectra of interest. These are the Fe304 and I would like to single out the Fe3P and the valence band if I display these in tiles in the scroll list, so there's an Fe3P and corresponding valence band spectrum in each one of these tiles, this is the state that will allow me to use the toolbar button that says Merge Irregular to create a new VAMAS file that will be based on each and every one of the tiles that we see in this scroll list in which we've got an Fe3P and a valence band spectrum displayed. I'm going to press this button and it asks me do you want to do this and I do. So I've created a new VAMAS file that contains spectra that represent a merge of the Fe3P and the valence band. And this allows me to interrogate these data using PCA. So when I press the PCA button it will calculate the abstract factors and display them overlaid currently in the active tile but I want to display them one per tile so I can have a look in detail at some of the lesser abstract factors and immediately when I look at the second abstract factor this is now in this VAMAS block here the process data in this VAMAS block it's showing me that a change did occur very subtle but it did occur throughout these iterations there's something perhaps in the third abstract factor and then the fourth abstract factor 
looks entirely consistent with noise. That is to say, I'm assuming Poisson type behavior, so I would expect a random distribution around a mean, and depending on the intensity, we would see more noise, and less intensity, we see less noise. So this is consistent with three abstract factors indicating that we've got information, not a lot in this third one, more in the second one, but most of the signal is gathered into the first one. What I'm going to do now is try and find out what the difference is between the first and the last spectrum in this list. I need to return the abstract factors to the original state and then I believe that the third abstract factor may just be some oscillation in the measurement process, something that has evolved not necessarily physically significant and so I'm going to reproduce these data using just the first two abstract factors and what that does is it makes sure that all of these data lie in a plane as opposed to a three-dimensional space. Higher dimensions I'm assuming are just noise so the significant information I've gathered now into two abstract factors and I've reproduced the data using the two abstract factors. So the next step is to look at differences between the first and the last. Now I've got all of these overlaid in the active tile. This difference button will act on the first and the last as selected when overlaid in this active tile. So when I press the difference, it will be the difference between the first and the last in this list. And the result of that is a list of spectra that are all slightly different in as much as each spectrum represents a slightly different proportion of the first spectrum subtracted from the last spectrum or vice versa. And it depends on which end of this list, which spectrum is the most significant in this difference relationship. But the idea is that we scan through this list and look for changes in the spectra that are induced by looking at the difference between the first and the last in the list. Before running through these, I'm going to adjust the line width to be one. The reason I've done this is the refresh rate is quicker when I have a line width of one as opposed to four. So I'm using the arrow keys and I can step through this list now and look for changes in the spectra that I deem to be significant. Now there's not a lot of difference, but the areas that I do perceive to be different are here. That is changing and that is changing. So I'm going back to my scroll list and looking at both of these at the same time. I'm looking for a plausible shape in this peak here. So that shape there looks reasonable to me. And now I want to know what happened to the valence band. I also want to see how the valence band relates to zero. So I'm going to add some major lines to be drawn so I can see have I gone below zero and yes I have so I'm going to go up a bit here I'm holding the control key down and that maintains the display settings I've got here so I see the same valence band as I adjust my display with the arrow key the up arrow so that looks like a plausible valence band and that looks like a plausible edge to this particular peak. So I'm going to take a copy. And this is bookkeeping. I've now taken a copy of the spectrum in this list that I thought was significant. I can step left with the arrow keys and then continue my search. And I need to keep going and accept that the different spectra will change in non-physical forms and if I keep increasing and let's just put some normalization on so that I can see both spectra clearly both the valence band and the 3p and I start to see something that looks again somewhat plausible and peak like 
And now I have a spectral shape which I consider to be different from the previous one. So I'm going to save that. And this is an iterative process that I can't claim that my first attempt at understanding these data will make sense. But I see something now in these data, which I turn off the normalization. That was a display form of normalization. There's also a numerical adjustment to the data that will alter the relationship of these two spectra. If I press this normalize button, this will normalize the intensities. And I can see now I have a clear difference in the shape and the position of these iron 3P. And I also have a very clear difference in the shape and position of the valence band spectra. It's not the same as I saw with the FE203, but I can identify within the FE304 spectra two different shapes that seem to make some sense in spectroscopic terms and also highlight a difference between the start and the end of those iterations. So what I'm thinking is that if I now take my data and my two computed forms for the component spectra into a new file, I can just verify that these two component forms are making sense in terms of reproducing the data. So I select after displaying my two component spectra in the active tile and use the LA linear analysis button and this will act on the selected spectra to produce from these two component spectra in the active tile a new VAMAS file that contains a fit of the component spectra to the data and I can now step down this list and make sure that each and every one of my measurements can be reproduced by these two component spectra and I'm now looking at a decomposition that shows me that although I started off with something that I thought was FE304 clearly there was something on the surface that is being disorbed or altered by the x-rays themselves so I do not now believe that my first few nanometers that are sampled by XBS of the FE304 are representative of FE304. The bulk may be FE304, but the first few nanometers sampled by XBS are not. In fact, it looks probable that what we've got is something closer to FE203 on the surface or some derivative of that, which is preventing us from measuring a pure FE304 standard spectrum from this particular pellet in this particular state.